Right, Cherubs, thank you for joining me once again. Today I'm doing something a little bit different. I was asked to do a review of the ridiculous plant munch's response to the criticism to this paper that was occurring around about August or so, it seems, last year. And I thought, no, instead of doing yet another who's wrong on the interwebs and sitting through yet another unbearable session of having to listen to that ridiculous turd Chris McCaskill, I thought instead what I'd do today is I'd actually look at the paper. And we'll see if the thing actually is of any value in any way to anybody except as a publication for its authors and as another piece of grist for the propaganda mills. Mm, stick around uh, and we'll have a look at this paper then. Right, thanks for sticking around. Here it is. Uh, it's published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and it's uh, basically a meta-analysis, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And the title of it is Red Meat Intake and Risk of Type 2 Diabetes in a Prospective Cohort Study of United States Females and Males. Now, there are several issues with the title of this paper. The first is the use of the word risk, because this paper is a meta-analysis of prospective cohort studies, which are associative studies, ergo unable in any way, shape or form to inform us on cause and effect. And given that risk is a cause and effect inference requiring a mechanism connecting the two things, that inference falls flat on its face. This data is unable to inform on risk. Another way of looking at it is to say when someone says red meat intake is associated with an increased risk, you could say this, whose risk? Mine? Yours? Barbara down the road? Brian across the street? Whose risk are you talking about? And by what mechanism are you claiming that there is a risk of a person following a behavior pattern associated with certain outcomes in a certain subset of people? So that would be, of course, your next point would be to say, well, great, who were the subjects in this study? And if the demographics of that population don't match you, then the finding of that paper for you is possibly quite limited then, isn't it? Anyway, let's make some kind of progress. So, risk. No, none of these prospective cohort studies are able to inform on risk. They all say risk. What they're actually talking about is a manufactured outcome variable called risk, which actually has no relationship at all with actual risk in the objective reality in which we all find ourselves. It's based on adjusting the observations made by a completely um, inappropriate bit of skullduggery statistically, which we'll talk about when we look at this paper. And yeah, so it's, it's a nonsense. Uh, also, it says that this is a cohort of females and males, which is correct, um, sure. But actually what it doesn't say there in the title is that this cohort was vastly, vastly represented by females and males were very much underrepresented in this group. So, whoops. Anyway, right, let's have a look at the authors. Uh, Zhao Gu is the first author. He is a bloke with apparently two master's degrees. Um, fine, okay, that's what he's got. One in how to do the actual statistical skullduggery, the actual inappropriate nonsense that's being done. And another one in public health statistics or something like that. Um, he also looks very, very young, um, which is not 
a pejorative statement in any way, but I would suggest that this is one of his earlier articles, is what I'm saying, and as such, may not be as polished as it might be. Obviously, he's had the help of a bunch of quite vastly more experienced authors, so that's probably offset somewhat, uh, including well-known card-carrying high priest of the Church of Anorexia Vegana, Walter C. Willett, the epidoodly moodly um guru, as it were. Um, and I've spoken at length in the past about my feelings about Walter C. Willett and his carry-on. You can find that uh, well, somewhere on the interwebs, if you take an odyssey of adventure, you'll find that floating around there somewhere, I would suggest. So, right, enough enough uh, background. Let's get into the abstract, which is a short description, which should tell us everything we need to know about this study. Right, background. Studies with methodological advancements are warranted to confirm the relation of red meat consumption to the incidence of type 2 diabetes. Okay, so, first of all, there's an inference there that epidemiology previously has been methodologically flawed in some way, because now there are advancements, is what's being inferred there. Although what those advancements are, we're not quite sure, and neither is Chris McCaskill, apparently, who claims to have quite a good background and, and indeed a master's degree in epidemiology himself, and he can't understand what these authors have done. So it must be good. Um, or not. Perhaps. Anyway, we'll see. Uh, they are warranted, these new sorts of studies. Well, of course you'd say that if you're writing such a study to confirm the relationship, it should say, between Red meat consumption and the incidence of type 2 diabetes. See, incidence. Yeah, that's what these studies should report on. This study doesn't report on incidence, though. It reports on this manufactured construct outcome variable called risk. You have to actually siphon through the data yourself to find the data on incidence, the thing that this paper is supposed to be talking about. Anyway, right, okay, objective. We aimed to assess the relationships of intakes of total processed and unprocessed red meat to risk. Well, you're going to fail then because you're not doing an experiment that can inform on risk of anything. You've, you've just said it in the sentence beforehand, incidence, and then straight to risk. So your objective fails. You cannot inform on risk with this study. This data does not have the power to inform on risk. All right, yeah, there we go. Done. We could actually probably stop now, but we won't. We'll keep going. All right. So, objective to assess the relationships of intakes of total processed and unprocessed red meat to risk, it says, of type 2 diabetes and to estimate the effects of substituting different protein sources for red meats on type 2 diabetes. Again, risk. So, again, no. And presumably, if you're talking about substitution of one sort of food for another sort of food in someone's diet, there must be an experimental protocol where some kind of substitution has in fact taken place that you can comment on. Turns out they haven't done that at all. This is all made up stuff, <laughs> all based on their models, their constructs, which we'll talk about in a minute. All right. Methods. Our study included 216,695 participants, which were 81% female, from the Nurses Health Study, NHS, NHS2, and Health Professionals Follow-Up Study, HPFS. Okay. So this is a well-trodden data set that's been used by multiple epididdly doodly moodly mologists looking for multiple relationships between multiple different things over multiple different years. Um, so it's a data set that I'm quite au fait with and know what it's all about, and etc. Um, let's see if these guys do. Okay, red meat intakes were assessed with, get this, semi-quantitative food frequency questionnaires. Every two to four years. Are we done? If we weren't already done at talking about risk when the study is incapable, are we done now? Semi-quantitative. Good science thing. 
because science is quantitative, not semi-quantitative. Uh, and we don't do science by asking people what they ate last week. We actually observe what they ate. And we keep them under control so that we know that the information we have is correct if we want to talk about risk, which is cause and effect. So, whoops, looks like, looks like we are absolutely done. Uh, several lines into the abstract of this particular excremental piece of propaganda. Um, Fear-mongering is what this is, really. All right. Uh, and also, they asked people what they've been eating every two to four years. Okay, are we done? All right. Good. Well, let's carry on anyway, because that's what we're here to do, is to show how poor this, how laughable this paper is. Uh, we used multivariable adjusted proportional hazards models to estimate the associations between red meats and type 2 diabetes. Okay, so first of all, if you adjust a data set from what it was when you observed it, you are fabricating data. That's not scientifically acceptable. It is acceptable, apparently, to the editors of these kind of journals that publish this kind of horseshit. But to science, this is not acceptable. This is not remotely acceptable as a scientific practice. It's based on the premise that a multivariable a multivariate regression is capable of passing out cause and effect and attributing it to various factors, which it fundamentally is not capable of doing. It suggests that, I mean, here's how ridiculous it is. We all know that X versus Y regression is that, it's association, it cannot inform on causality, not one jot. Everybody knows that. So why in the purple fuck would we believe that a multiple regression of that kind, a whole bunch of those stacked on top of each other, each with a contributory error, by the way, can possibly pass out cause and effect? How does that work? It doesn't. There is no logic there. That is impossible. Um... It's just more associative data. So they've adjusted the data, so that's completely invalid, even if we weren't already done with this paper. And the data they've got is semi-quantitative food, uh, food frequency questionnaires, which are so granular as to be tested every two to four years. Okay. So, I mean, really, if anyone wants to read this paper any further than that, it's probably because they're a propagandist themselves trying to um, find reason to believe a fallacy, really, because that's the only explanation for me. Those who actually want to use this as evidence for anything on their trippy little YouTube videos where they splash this paper up, look, here's proof of something, for three seconds and then pull it down again, they haven't, none of those people have probably even read it or, or are interested in reading it or understanding it, actually. But there it is. Okie dokie, right, so what are the results? <clears throat> Over 5,483,981 person years of follow-up, we documented 22,761 type 2 diabetes cases. Total. The entire number of um, diagnoses of type 2 diabetes that were made over that number of person years of follow-up in this study. That equates to 41 per 100,000 person years of follow-up. Okay? Or 4.1 per 10,000 person years of follow-up, all right? So you work that out yourself for a 100-year individual human being lifespan. That was the total incidence. Okay. Interesting. Right. 
Intakes of total, processed, and unprocessed red meat were positively and approximately linearly associated with higher risks. No, not risks, because the risk thing was the model produced fantasy outcome. What we need to do is actually look at the incidences, which are listed later in the paper. We'll get to that soon. Um, right. So. Positively and approximately linearly associated with higher risks, no, of type 2 diabetes. See how there's no numbers there in that sentence at all? Perhaps they're going to give us the numbers in the next sentence. Comparing the highest to lowest quintiles, okay, hazard ratios, no, not hazard, because the hazard ratio is based on this risk thing, which is a fabricated variable, right, were 1.62 with a 95% confidence interval of 1.53 to 1.71 for total red meat. All right, so we're talking about maybe around about two-thirds increase over baseline in the fifth quartile of meat consumption. So what is two-thirds of 41? Well, let's ask Mr. Calculator. So point, we'll actually use the correct numbers because we've got the calculator up, 0. 0.62. 0. 0.62. Okay. Times 41. There's an extra 25. 0.42 incidences if this risk was reflective of the actual incidences, which it's not because it's adjusted. But we've got 25 extra so called instances per 100,000 person years of follow up there. Are we done? If we weren't already done? Even if that was a cause and effect relationship, which it isn't, are we done at that? Incredible. Absolutely incredible that this paper thinks it's reporting something of utility to any given living human being over a 100 year lifespan, because it isn't, is it? Then there's a bunch of other results that they're listing in here as well. So, for unprocessed red meat, so they've separated that out of 1.4, so that's nothing as well. Um, and then they're talking about lowering risk by substituting things. Well, there was no experimental protocol where they substituted anything for anything else. So all of these statistics are completely fabricated on the basis of their model. Nothing to do with the observations made. Uh, and they're all... Very, very small changes in terms of the absolute outcome. We're talking the same sort of reductions, 20-something per 100,000 person years of follow-up there. All right. And they're not causal. Look, here's an example of what I'm talking about. We'll get to it when we have a look at the, the, the table that describes these populations. As the meat consumption goes up per quartile, so does the intake of food mass total, as estimated using a heat unit measurement for some reason. So that's a confounding variable. So therefore this paper is now unable to inform on cause and effect. Because there are two collinear variables there, at least. Are there others as well? Well, yes, we'll have a look at that in a minute. All right, but anyway, there we go. So conclusions. Our study supports current dietary recommendations for limiting consumption of red meat intake. No, it doesn't. Your study does no such thing, Mr. Goo. No, no such thing at all. Like, for example, here's another confounding variable that we'll get to. Uh, as the red meat consumption went up, so did the consumption of carbohydrate i.e. we've got a Randall cycle activation occurring there, so it's actually nothing to do with the red meat. 
this study doesn't look at the red meat under control. So it's just an associative mishmash. And they're not even reporting what's associated with what. They're reporting on this fabricated fantasy outcome risk. It's incredible, right. Uh, and emphasizes the importance of different alternative sources of protein. Well, no, it doesn't, because again, it's based on some fantasy you guys made up. This passes for science these days, kids. This is what science is in nutrition. Good. All right. So, type 2 diabetes is a major. Blah, 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 blah. Yes, we know all of that. Methods. Yep, yep, we know what's been done. Yep. Blah, 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 blah. Yep. Fine. Statistical analysis. This is the bit where they explicitly state there that they're using a model to estimate this thing called hazard, which they've made up. Um, and they're basing that on adjusting an observation they made to something that it wasn't. Okay. Yep. So now we can see what's passing for science here. Because, I mean, remember the paper said it was talking about um, about incidents, and then we find out that they're really not talking about incidents. They've collected the incidents data, and it's reported in the paper, buried halfway through, but they're reporting on some other variable they made up on the basis of it, a construct, risk, so-called. All right. So that's the results table there. Let's have a look at the baseline characteristics in these study populations. So we, we have very clear differences in the caloric intakes from less meat consumption to higher meat consumption, so-called caloric intakes. That means more mass of food is being eaten as more meat is being eaten, which is a confound to the finding of the study as that relates to incidences of type 2 diabetes. So, that's the main point there. Um, associations between red meat intake and risk, no, of diet. So this is the fabricated numbers. Because if you want the actual outcome statistics of this paper, there they are. And this is for total red meat, the first category. So what we're looking at here is three... 1,187 cases per roughly million person years of follow-up in the referent population. And up here, it's all the way up at 5,715 per million. Okay? That's what we're looking at in this paper. Why don't they just report that and say, well, we found that the incidence of type 2 diabetes per person per year of follow-up was remarkably low in this population. And sure, there were differences that we observed between the incidences in different populations. But so what, really? Because it's not really meaningful to any one given living human being over a 100-year lifespan. Nice. And here we have some pretty graphs drawn on. Look at this sort of almost linear straight line relationship between these two variables, forgetting once again that the variable listed here on the y-axis is a made-up variable, hazard, and it's expressed as a relative thing rather than as an absolute thing, which is the thing that we're absolutely interested in as absolute beings existing in an absolute universe, perhaps, rather than some fantasy variable made up on the basis of adjusting what was observed to something different. Mm. There it is, basically. This, I don't even know what this is, I'm not even going to read that, that's just a mess. Here are the various outcomes for various things pulled out in isolation, which is completely inappropriate anyway. Looks like it's sprayed all over the place in any case, and as such. <laughs> And this is the substitution stuff, which they didn't actually do. This isn't based on any observation even. This is a model pulled out of the model, made up from the observations that they adjusted. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, I'm impressed. 
Uh, here is a graph that shows that these results are particularly unimpressive, it seems, anyway, actually, which we already know because we've looked at the actual incidences. Um, and then we, we say here that the, all the authors have no conflict of interest. It, well, that's not so with Walter Willett. Simply isn't so. Walter Willett absolutely does have an agenda and a vast both egotistical and financial interest in furthering his ridiculous philosophical theological belief structure in a plant-based diet. So that is my take on this paper, basically. Um, an absolutely excremental piece of laughable humour for any of us who understand what science is, how science is conducted, and what the value of any given data set is. So basically the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition needs to give itself seven or eight very solid uppercuts, rethink who is on its editorial board, I would say urgently, and start requiring scientists to conduct themselves according to the disciplines of science. And this is not it remotely. So there it is. That's my response in full to this absolutely excremental piece of garbage that has made its way into the peer-reviewed literature by some means. Um, and basically it's par for the course with all of these nutri nutritional epidemiology type studies. They are all as bad as this. They all have the same flaws and foibles. None of this pile of turd is evidence of anything and it must not be accepted by any of us in any discussion at any time as evidence of anything and the reasons i think i've been quite clear about today there it is thank you for joining me here on my sunday and join me again throughout the coming week where people will be wrong on the interwebs i imagine for that seems to be not slowing down see you then ciao